I'm Running Man, and this fantastic building is the Royal Geographical Society in London. For about the last 170 years, it's been at the centre of world exploration. Intrepid explorers from around the world have come here to pitch their projects and share their findings. From this platform, people like Shackleton and Livingston have enthralled audiences with their tales of adventure and discovery. Now, people still come here to listen to lectures, but in the 21st century, there is a fundamental difference. The emphasis has changed from exploration to conservation. Now, our journey is a bit different from the old explorers. It's a 21st century mission, and by using satellite technology, we'll report from the jungles of South America as we review the many forces now threatening the environment and remote tribal communities. Surinam, one of the most biologically and culturally diverse areas in the world today. As a developing nation, the youngest independent country in South America, its government face a real challenge. How do they utilize their rich natural resources without destroying their environment? So this is Paramaribo. Paramaribo! The name actually means the old wooden city. Of the 400,000 people that live in Suriname, pretty much every single one of them lives here. It's not strictly true, but the interior, a huge space, is inhabited by no more than 50,000 people, and that's split into basically two different groups. Amerindians, or the indigenous communities, the first inhabitants of this area, and the Maron peoples of African origin, who are displaced in a way. They're runaway slaves, brought here in the 17th century by the Dutch and the English, who fought for and won their freedom in around 1670. Now Suriname is in a very rare position. 90% of its jungle or its forest is still intact. Now, at the same time, it's struggling financially. So, it's a real dilemma. The international communities are saying, well, don't cut down your forest for timber. turn around and say, well, what other resources do we have? Now, in this first show, we're looking at one of the ways they're trying. It's by the development of ecotourism. For the last couple of days, myself and my crew have been setting up our trip through the jungle on a virgin trail that no one's ever been on before. I think it's the perfect way to start. I'm totally unprepared for it. So is the crew. And uh, it really is the deepest, darkest jungle. Hundreds of miles of unbroken jungle with just a few primitive roads that are soon reclaimed by nature if no one uses them. For a journey that starts quite fast, it doesn't take long before untamed nature and tropical weather conditions slow us down. Obviously, the roads here aren't designed for mass tourism, but I guess that's all part of the adventure. Our bus driver really showed some skill and patience as he edged his way along the treacherous route. Apparently, it changes every time. It's not exactly a trip down your local high street. At the banks of the Copanama River, we were met by our guides from the local Quinty tribe. Cool. They're Maron people of African origin, whose unique understanding of this environment we'll need to rely on in the coming days. And that's how it started, our first mission. If ecotourism is about bringing people close to nature, then Stinasu's beautiful camp on Fungu Island, in the heart of one of the largest reserves in the world, is in the perfect location. So, so Stinasu has uh, um, three main objectives. 
biodiversity research in the reserves is one. Uh, education is the second, doing awareness campaigns and awareness uh, projects. And the third one is, is tourism. If you say ecotourism in Europe, some people think it's a sort of mm -hmm. some, some yogurt drink or yeah. something, some whole yeah. food. Yeah. Tourism has to be one of the alternatives for the huge logging uh, ideas that governments of this country had before. A kind of uh, specialty tourism where people make a choice to come to Suriname to enjoy the pristine nature reserve of the pristine rainforest. And that's something we can offer and other countries cannot offer. So we are not aiming on that mass <laughs> yeah. uh, tourism. My alarm call on our first morning in the jungle was a troop of howler monkeys playing close to the camp. At breakfast, we fueled up with a group of tourists that would be joining us for the day ahead. The plan is this morning we're going to um, climb Volksberg, which is one of the largest land masses in Suriname. Apparently, it has the most spectacular views, so uh, it should be amazing. Now, I've often wondered what role ecotourism can play in preserving nature. I guess it's simple, really. It's a lot less damaging to extract hard-earned dollars from a tourist pocket than it is to rip out slow-grown hardwoods from the forest. Struggling under the weight of my high-tech equipment, it wasn't long before I envied the carefree group as they ambled along the trail. I mean, that, it was only seven kilometers walk, but it was really, really hot. I mean, every single step was <sighs> unbelievable. And coming out and seeing that sight just makes it all worth it. If trudging through the jungle with our kit was tough, the climb would have been brutal. So we decided to leave most of our gear at the base and started our ascent. This whole area comprises of a small part of one of the largest, the largest in fact, the largest neotropical rainforest in the whole of the world. It's absolutely pristine, unbroken jungle. In fact, 1.6 million hectares of it. There's 684 types of birds. There's innumerable species of reptiles. There's jaguars and spiders this big. And it's the most alive place I've ever been in my life. And it's, it's amazing. It's also the hottest place. So what did you think of the, the climb? It's great. Great reward after a walk of three hours, yes. It's, it's a nice place to be here. Uh, first time in Suriname, but not the last one, I think. We've done, we've done the first section of the, the, the trip, and, I, and the, the other tourists that were with us have gone now. So where, where are we going to stay tonight? Well, tonight we're going to stay in the small camp at the base of the Volksberg. Yeah. And then tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to what, what was the place called? The Van Stockenberg. Van Stockenberg. Yes. Leaving behind the comforts to Nasu's last outpost, we headed deeper into the jungle, forging a new trail. Once to Nasu, hope would be used by researchers and intrepid tourists to explore the richness of this area. It was a seriously punishing journey almost enough of a test in itself. But add to that having to build a camp, and that proved a little more difficult than expected. There's a revenge of a tree. I was there, I was slicing into it, and uh, as it came down, this whole big branch came from the canopy and uh, smashed me on the head. It didn't take long to realize that my naive enthusiasm was definitely no replacement for centuries of inherent jungle knowledge. You won't die from food poisoning. <laughs> as the camp filled with the sweet smell of food, I watched in amazement as our guides skillfully put the finishing touches on the new Stanasu Lodge, making sure we'd have the best night's sleep.
Where's lunch, Cedric? Lunch? <laughs> Eat it time. Mmm. Skinny chicken and beans has never tasted so good. I, I wasn't the only one snoring, I know that. You, you're a pretty Olympic snorer too, as well. Like, you've got a gurgling action going on there. <laughs> Having slept so well, I was really reluctant to get out of bed. As the solar panels charged the camera batteries, Raymond, our head guide, led us off into the jungle to announce our peaceful intentions to the forest spirits. For the Quinty, the forest is full of magical spirits and an offering is always customary to ensure safe passage. Do you do this is the alasani. Boom. Yeah. After Raymond's reassuring words, we set off, hacking our way through the entangled mass of green towards the base of the mountain. With every step, a new perspective was dawning on me, a back-to-basics reality, and I was learning fast. Hi. If water no be there, we go there. Leaving our bags by the stream, Raymond led us on. Go to the top of the fast One more kilometer. Go. It's the most beautiful view that I've ever seen in Suriname. It's amazing. Everything here is uh, protected because uh, a lot of people come over and they ask, they want to see more. And that's why we have also in our package to bring people maybe for a few days to go uh, to the Van Stockholm. Everything we do, everything we do, we do it with the local people, with the Quinty people. We always try to put them in a uh, besides Tinazi and work with them together. Because right. they, I mean, obviously they've been here for a long time and they, they understand. They understand everything and they know everything about the river. And the, the guides that we went to on Stockholm were from the Quinty. Yeah, right? they're also from the Quinty. Relaxing in the calm of the afternoon, we had time to collect our thoughts. As is walking on the path on the way back, Now I'm thinking that if the Surinamese government, or, or any government for that matter, were to rely solely on ecotourism to supply an alternative to clear cutting the forest for timber, then that beautiful trail that I was walking on would have to be a motorway. And the little lodges and huts that it led to would have to be four star hotels. Having shared so much with our new friends in the forest, I was reluctant to say goodbye. But it's great to see the positive steps being taken by Stenasu. Aware of the dangers of overexploitation, they consider the local people in everything they do. But national parks only cover a very small part of Suriname, and the world outside their protection is another story. So to discover a little bit about the problems affecting the northwestern region, we met with the local, Roberto Plomp. This is the Maritaka River, and I'm tempted to say that parrots and macaws are starting to be an endangered species here also. Roberto passionate environmentalist and eco-tour operator had invited us to join him on a 200 kilometer journey up the Marataka. With a remote jungle encampment as our goal, we raced to beat the sunset. 
We just arrived at the camp. I feel a lot warmer than five minutes ago. I think it's probably the prospect of food. This camp is called Den Denifi, and uh, Roberto and a couple of his guys built it. It took them about five days, but it really is beautiful. There might not be thousands of parrots, but there's thousands of mozzies. Oh, definitely. <laughs> oh, you should have seen them when, when we came here to build the camp, because it was all damp and... Definitely. Uh, yeah, there were loads of them, and big ones. This yeah. area in general, uh, whenever you came here before 96, in the mornings, early in the mornings, hundreds, literally hundreds of parrots would fly over. It doesn't happen anymore. And really, a mukor is a beautiful animal. If you see it in a cage, even a big one, it's a beautiful animal. It's beautiful to look at, but it's more beautiful in nature. It is so beautiful to see these animals. So, yeah, I miss them. What's the plan for today? Um, today we'll uh, go to Morishi Sabana. It's an area with Mauritius palms, and that's where they nest. Roberto's description of the day ahead sounded so simple. Bird watching in the tropics. For a few moments, it all seemed quite idyllic. But trying to navigate a 35-foot dugout through winding, narrow waterways in the middle of the jungle is definitely a bit tricky. Whoa! Now when I think about South American rivers, like most, I generally imagine hungry piranha. But with no other option than to free the boat, Roberto and his crew bravely set to work. In the same way we couldn't foresee the obstacles ahead, we couldn't predict the weather, and it seemed to change by the minute. We just came up against a, a little stumbling block as we turned a corner and obviously it's pouring with rain. We went straight into um, a fallen palm tree. We just hacked through it. <laughs> and it's, we just cut through it with the, uh, the machete. And it gets narrower and narrower as we go up. We keep coming around corners and smashing into the bank. It's a bit like spinning out on a Grand Prix circuit, but on a natural level. Actually, each time we hit the bank, a thousand little insects jump in the boat. It's like they want to take a ride. Literally like ants, big, big ants, and just diving into the boat. As the sun came out, we broke through the last section of forest into the spectacular savannah. <laughs> It wasn't long before I got my first glimpse of the macaws. See these palms here? These are the Marishi palms, which are the absolute perfect habitat for macaws and parrots. And what they do is they bore a little hole inside the palm and they live inside them. And that's why this whole, this whole area is covered with the Marishi palm. It's in fact called the Marishi savanna. Now, though we did see the odd pair darting between the palms, and a distant flock. For the most part, the skies were empty, and a disappointed Roberto decided to show us the reason why. The Marataka River really has just one village on it. It's called Cupido. It's about four hours downstream. And as we passed, Roberto explained the story. In recent years, about half of the village have actually left to go to Paramaribo, the capital city, in search of gainful employment, I guess you'd call it. And it really sort of illustrates the pressures that are on local communities. It's no longer good enough to, to stay put where you are in your traditional ways. They actually want material possessions. They want to make money. So half of the village is left. And the half that remains have to rely on their surroundings, on the natural resources. And that obviously puts a lot of pressure, although on a small scale, on this area, because basically the main resources available here, those that can be translated directly to cash, are tropical hardwoods and wildlife. With 27 companies in Suriname authorized to trade in wildlife and markets established all over the world, 
it's not surprising that locals like Michael are tempted to catch parrots. What Michael does is he climbs up into the tree of a certain palm tree and uh, makes a nest, a fake nest, taking a, a lure parrot like this one up with him. He sits in the nest. This one would call to other parrots and they, they fly to the nest. So how, how many you catch? How many? Parrot. How many one, you one day. One day. Yes, about 10, 12, 15. Really? Yes, one morning. One morning. He's <laughs> coming up to get my ear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful bird. Beautiful bird. To stop him from flying, you pull the feathers? No, I cut no. it with a scissors. Look at this. Yeah. Try and get a shot of this wing. Now, if one person is catching 15 birds in one day, and the allocation for export of these birds was something like 650, it doesn't take a genius to work out that there's a lot more birds going out in the country than uh, the allocation. You can raise awareness, but you also need to uh, supply an alternative for their earnings. Um, yeah, one alternative would be uh, ecotourism, of course, um, but there are also other poss possibilities. As our guide steered a course off the main river, we found ourselves in an eerie flooded forest. The most dense jungle we'd seen so far. Surrounded by so much nature, it's easy to let your imagination run away with you. As we drifted through the murky backwaters, a strange chorus of unfamiliar sounds kept all our senses alert. It may seem like a strange comparison, but to me the rainforest is a bit like deep space. With every trip into the unknown, new discoveries are made. Here in the jungle, there's still so much to learn, so much that we don't know. And yet in unprotected areas like this, home to the giant anaconda, wild cats, monkeys and rare birds, the future is anything but certain. Although our trip here in the Marataka with the WWF and Roberto has been mostly about the decreasing populations of parrots, there is another factor that's affecting this region, and it's logging. It's only on a small scale at the moment, but apparently this whole area is also given away in concessions, allowing people the rights to extract timber. And this is just a small example. It's the only one we've seen, but the way that they're logging here has a major impact on the land. And if you look onto the bank, you can actually see that they have large trucks. And these trucks don't come along roads, they're actually floated down the river. And it's an indication in some way of how far they've gone into the forest already, and how many logs they've taken out. I mean, you don't need a, a truck to go 10 feet, 20 feet. That's, that's serious logging. In this area, there's no control whatsoever. So uh, The law on logging. Yeah. The law on this, yeah. Um, and the way they cut it here is just, when there's a uh, demand, they cut the wood and they just cut all they need from an area. And if it's the whole bush, they cut the whole bush. How long would a, a, a mature tree like this, this one that we're sitting on, take to grow? You know, I haven't learned. Uh. <laughs> now, although Roberto is no specialist, as someone who's grown up in this area, he has seen the changes firsthand. As we travel back to his camp, I prepared a web page summarising the day's experiences. It's really quite amazing. We're 150 miles away from the nearest telephone or communication system. And yet, here in the middle of the forest, because of the communications equipment we have, we can offer people like Roberto a rare chance to voice their opinions directly by the World Wide Web. Join us as we travel on through the heart of this little known country. It's a journey of discovery. And in the coming weeks, we'll be meeting with tribal shaman and learning about the importance of preserving their ancestral knowledge. We'll look at the threats and forces at work within the disappearing jungles of South America. And by applying cutting-edge technology at a grassroots level, we hope to offer remote tribal communities a digital platform through which to share their rich cultural heritage and voice their hopes and fears. I'm going to make a phone call. 
I think it's 24,000 miles up, catch by satellite and beam to London. Dad? Just? Yes, I'm in the middle of the largest jungle in the world, on top of a mountain. OK, listen, it was just a quick call to say that I love you and uh, I'll, I'll speak to you soon. I think it was actually his phone that was having a problem with it.